Tim, where are you? Come on up. We're going to continue the, con continue the conversation with Tim O'Reilly. Sir, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. All right. So um, I want to start out by acknowledging that I only met Doug once. We sat down for maybe two hours and talked in 2007. And what was most striking to me that I'd been kind of in this whole project where people were trying to get him to kind of rehash the past and collect more you know, of the history of uh, what he'd done and kind of oral history. And I said, wait a minute, this guy doesn't want to talk about what he did you know, at that point 40 years ago. He wants to talk about what's happening now and how we move forward into the future. And you know, so we ended up talking a lot about Google and the World Wide Web and how it was or was not an instantiation of uh, what he had dreamed about. Uh, you know, we talked about this idea uh, uh, that, we, that basically what we needed to do was put collective IQ together with uh, solving great problems. I think this uh, uh, point that he makes uh, about uh, if we don't get collectively smarter, we're doomed is a very powerful, powerful idea. Now, we did not talk about climate change. That happens to be kind of the devil we have today. Uh, uh, as Frank Herbert, my mentor, once said, uh, give us this day our daily devil. Uh, because it is, in fact, uh, one of those things that makes us stronger. But you know, ultimately, Doug understood, as I think we need to understand, that solving problems is what technology is for. I mean, the history of humanity is getting smarter about solving the problems that we face. Uh, my friend Nick Hanauer has this great framing of this. He says, prosperity in human societies is best understood as the accumulation of solutions to human problems. Uh, he was talking about this in the context of all the foo-for-all about we're going to run out of jobs. And he's like, no, we won't run out of work until we run out of problems. And I like to say, are we done yet? I don't think so. so you know, here's a, you know, maybe a current list, you know, dealing with climate change, rebuilding infrastructure, which is not up to the challenges of the 21st century, feeding the world, ending disease. I think mass migration, huge opportunity. I, I get really mad whenever I, I, I uh, you know, talk to people about sidewalk labs. I go, really? This is the best you can do is we're going to make a cool tech suburb outside of Toronto? What about resettling millions of people? There are people who are going to be in refugee camps that have to grow into cities. Here's a really interesting tech challenge that actually will mean something. You know, uh, you know caring for each other. Yeah. You know. We had, you know, the great uh, quote at the end of Kai Fu Lee's book, uh, you know, um, AI Superpowers, where he talks about, you know, how do we bring, you know, the caring economy into the actual economy? You know, you know, wh when did we make this decision to leave this most human of activities outside our accounting of what we consider economic? You know, the most valuable thing we do is care for each other, and somehow we've excluded it from our accounting. You know, we have to, education will always matter. And, but really, how do we build shared prosperity for more and more people? So this is where I, I, I love what Doug had to say about this, that technology is never about replacing humans. If we do it right, it, it, this is the think, thinking of small minds, right? Big minds understand that it is about amplifying human capability so that we can do more. So, you know, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of what amplification looks like today. You know, uh, and you know, we're, we've got a science fiction version. Uh, many of you probably saw The Matrix, and you may remember the scene in which, uh, you know, they're about to be killed, and uh, uh, there's a helicopter on the rooftop, and Neo says to Trinity, "Can you fly that thing?" And she says, "Not yet," and she downloads the knowledge into her brain. Now, this isn't actually how it would likely work because the fact is uh, the, the, the helicopter would probably fly itself by now. Uh, uh, but you know, think about the current state of knowledge augmentation. We carry a device which gives us a new sense 
that we didn't used to possess. Maybe the, you know, the Aboriginal song lines did and some of the Polynesian navigators who could read the currents, but most of us were so stupid that we didn't know where the hell we were most of the time. Now we have a device that tells us all the time where we are and how to get anywhere else. And we're starting to build new businesses. You know, you think about something like Uber and Lyft and that ability to basically cognitively augment the driver. You know, we don't understand really that cognitive augmentation makes new combinations possible. You know, so here is this idea of a marketplace of on-demand drivers who are not trained because the knowledge is in their devices. And so that is a metaphor for how we might rethink many other areas. How would we do healthcare when more of the knowledge is in the devices? Might we move away from this factory model of, of healthcare to a human-centered model where you're outsourcing a lot of the repetitive things, where you're, you know, you're basically effectively doing what Paul Farmer did with community health workers, except they're augmented with technology in the way that an Uber driver is augmented. There's so much we can do with knowledge augmentation. There's also this ability to just do things that were not economic. A great example of this is some work that we do at Code for America, which is my wife's nonprofit, uh, working to bring technology to government. So there's a situation in California where we passed two propositions, spent a lot of money to pass these propositions to decriminalize various things uh, and, and, and give people the opportunity to clear their criminal record, which basically gives them access to jobs, housing, and so on. The problem was, you know, nobody ever thought about implementation. And so uh, with the first one of these, Prop 47, uh, there were basically a couple million people eligible. I think they cleared about 10,000 records because basically the process was you hired a lawyer, you went into the DA's office, you got your record downloaded, you filled out a bunch of forms, you filled petition to the court. You know, who could afford to do that? And now. They're starting to talk about automatic expungement. So California, the San Francisco DA said after Prop 64, the, the marijuana legalization, he said, well, we're going to expunge automatically all the records in San Francisco. But what was their idea of automatic? It was, well, we'll hire a bunch of paralegals who will individually download the records. <laughs> and, and we were like, no, 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 no. You know, there's something called bulk download. There's the ability to feed these things into a program and spit them out into three buckets, eligible, uh, take a look at this for you know, human judgment, not eligible, uh, and then automatically submit to the court. And so that's what we've been working on. So this is not putting lawyers out of work. It's doing something that was just not being done. So this is, again, think about that augmentation of how do we actually tackle more jobs. You know, here's another one I love. Um, uh, this is a, a group called the Immigration Policy Lab at Stanford, where they're basically uh, looking at how do you actually resettle immigrants, particularly refugees, uh, in places where they're more likely to get a job. And using the massive tools of big data and AI, we can actually do better predictions and get people integrated more quickly. That seems to me like a 21st century knowledge competency that we should be saying, yeah, hey, can we get more of that? But of course, uh, you know, so this is really the opportunity you know, for us to use these incredible cognitive tools that we are building today. Uh, you know, uh, uh, this is Paul Cohen, uh, who was a former DARPA program manager and now runs the School of Information Sciences at Pitt. He said we were at the National Academies in some uh, session on AI, and I loved it when he said this. I wrote it down, I've been quoting it ever since. He said, the opportunity for AI is to help humans model and manage complex interacting systems. You know, so, but you know, many of the problems we have uh, is that the tools we thought would make us smarter also seem to be making us dumber and more divided. As Rene Duresta says, misinformation is now a chronic condition. Now, we do know something about how to manage this chronic condition. I mean, Google search for a long time worked pretty well. A lot of it's what, what, what goes wrong uh, is something we're only coming to grips with. And we're, we're coming to grips with it. We're realizing it. It crept up on us in the way that Ernest Hemingway described bankruptcy in The Sun Also Rises. His character, Mike, uh, is asked, how did you go bankrupt? And he says, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. And in that same way, gradually, then suddenly, this thing that we thought was going to be so good for the world started to turn into a problem. Now we're waking up to it. We're in the suddenly phase. 
and gradually then suddenly artificial intelligence and algorithmic systems are everywhere. There are new kinds of partnerships with humans, and we don't know how to manage them. You know, and here's the thing. We have to understand that we are living inside the machine. I think one of the big shifts for the 21st century is to change our, no our sense of what collective intelligence is. Because we think of it as somehow we, the individual, being augmented to be smarter, to make better decisions, maybe to work with other people uh, in a uh, uh, in more productive way. But in fact, many of the tools of collective intelligence we are contributing to, and the intelligence is outside of us. We are part of it. We are feeding into it. Think about Google. This is a worker in a Google data center. But all of us are inside Google. All of us who use Facebook are inside Facebook. We are part of it. We're fed with it. It changes who we, who we are, how we think, shapes us as we shape it. We're almost like the microbiome of a massive hybrid AI that is only now being born. So it's not just in the digital realm. You think about uh, something like Uber or an Amazon warehouse. You're starting to see how that's working in the physical world. And the question is whether we're going to manage the machine or whether it will manage us. Now, we tell ourselves in Silicon Valley that we're in charge. This is a picture of what Eric Ries calls the build, measure, learn cycle. I wrote once that uh, many of today's workers are programs and software developers are actually their managers. You know, they're inspecting the performance of their workers and giving them instruction in the form of code you know, about how to do a better job. But you know, in many ways, the reality is a lot more like this. You know, we basically uh, built this machine. Uh, we think we know what it's going to do. And, and it suddenly turns out not quite the way we expected. So here are Facebook uh, uh, engineers right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, uh, but here's the, the question. You know, these machines that we build, I compare them to the genies of Arabian mythology. Uh, you know, there's always you get to express your wish, and you always get it wrong. Now, in, in AI parlance, we talk about this as the runaway objective function. You know, uh, Nick Bostrom's paperclip maximizer. I mean, this was in the Arabian Nights, you know, uh, many years ago. I love actually Elon Musk's version, which is, you know, the, the self-improving strawberry-picking robot that eventually decides that humans are in the way of strawberry fields forever, right? Um, but so we have to think about that fundamental goal that we give these systems. Because yes, there is all this intelligence, this new co-evolution and combination of human and machine. But ultimately, it's driven by what we tell it to optimize for. And so the question I have really come to grips with is the fact that there is another of these hybrid master AIs besides Google and Facebook that we need to think about. We call it the market. Uh, this is not a Google data center. This is Equinix NY4, uh, which is uh, a big Wall Street data center. We have to realize that the market, as we now understand it, is a master collective intelligence. And we have to ask ourselves, what objective function have we given it? And I think it is the paperclip maximizer. You know, back in 1970, Milton Friedman said, the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. And that's exactly what Brewster was talking about earlier today. At some point, we started building a system that tells every company, no matter how idealistic, you know, uh, Google with do no evil, you know, uh, connect people to knowledge, uh, Facebook, let's connect people, to say, hey, you must continue to grow. That is the master algorithm of our society. And we have built a machine, and we have told it that that's what it must relentlessly optimize for, that people are a cost to be eliminated. So we are building the paperclip maximizer as a society, and we need to pull back from that. And there are alternatives. And one of the things that I've gotten really excited about is, is a book uh, by Kate Raworth, who's an Oxford economist, called Donut Economics. Because she has a metaphor that's very different than the growth graph that goes always up and to the right. And if you're interested at all in, in uh, you know, uh, uh, astronomy, you probably know about the, the, the habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone, uh, you know, not too warm, not too cold, where life is possible. She says that's the right way to think about the economy. It's like a donut. You know, there's economic undershoot. People don't have enough to eat. They don't have uh, shelter. They don't have access to opportunity. They don't have education. They don't have clean water. Uh, they don't have health care. And on the 
outside of the donut is economic overshoot, climate change, you know, things like the ozone depletion, and you know, species loss. There's so much that you can start to understand when you use this model. And her question is, how do we keep in the donut? That is the job of putting these AIs and this collective intelligence to work. And there are small signs of it. Carla Gomez at, Carmel, uh, at Cornell has something called the Institute for Con Computational Sustainability, which is all about this idea of how do we take more data into account uh, to build complex computational models, kind of like what Paul Cohen was saying. How do we model and manage complex interactive systems? I, I don't go into the details of her work because I'm over time, but this is the question. Can we build an economic flywheel that keeps us in the donut? And I think only with cognitive augmentation beyond even what Doug imagined. So there's plenty of work uh, to go on. Uh, we better get on with it. Thank you. <laughs>